He was 12th annual Frank and Profit Lecture on Law and Public Service. Um, this lecture is always the high point of the academic year at the University of Maine School of Law. Uh, it is also um, an honor for me to have the opportunity to present to you our distinguished lecturer, Scott Harshbarger, and to introduce as well Judge Frank and Coffin, the distinguished jurist and public servant for whom this lecture uh, is named. Um, Scott Harshbarger and I thought that we would like to uh, deliver our remarks from up here, but with his characteristic modesty, Judge Coffin declined. <laughs> Um, we're also pleased this evening to welcome the family members of Judge Coffin, uh, Mrs. Ruth Coffin, uh, Judge Coffin's wife, as you all know, uh, and their children, Meredith, Susan, and Douglas. Uh, and also the many of Judge Coffin's clerks, who as a group have been so instrumental in making this lecture series a reality. Um, we're thrilled not only to have our main, Judge Coffin's main clerks, but also a number of people from um, the Boston area who've come uh, this evening. The University of Maine School of Law takes great pride in its sponsorship of the annual Coffin Lecture. Um, the lecture reflects and celebrates the law school's strong and abiding commitment to public service and it uh, challenges all of us each year to consider new ways to ensure that the law and the legal profession continue to serve the public good. The law school has a long record of public service to Maine, uh, to New England, and to the nation, and we think that this lecture series uh, is uh, uh, one of those. Uh, since its inception in 1992, under the administration of my predecessor, Don Zellman, who was dean then, the Cotton Lecture has brought to our uh, community uh, an array of extraordinarily talented and thoughtful individuals. Each of our 11 previous Coffin lecturers who are listed in your program has challenged us to reflect in new ways upon the powerful intersection of law and public service. And there is no doubt in my mind that Mr. Harshbarger will continue in that fine tradition. We have enjoyed our conversations over the last months uh, about um, this event. Um, for those of you who are new, um, Coffin Lectures are selected by a committee composed of faculty, students, and former clerks of Judge Coffin. The committee looks for distinguished individuals who are exemplars of a life devoted to law and dedicated public service. And Scott Marshbarger clearly fits the profile. His career has blended law and public service in many varied contexts in the private practice of law, in government service, in public advocacy, and in academia. A native of Pennsylvania, and I learned this evening the son of a minister, Mr. Harshbarger, it's probably why he wanted to be up here. <laughs> Mr. Harshbarger graduated in 1964 from Harvard College, where he was not only a fine student, but also a nationally regarded halfback. He is, in fact, the only person I have ever actually met who appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated. <laughs> uh, after graduation from, uh, Harvard, uh, from Harvard College, he went to Harvard Law School in 1968. Uh, after that, he entered the private practice of law with the Boston firm of Goodwin, Proctor, and Hoare. But the call up to public service was strong, and in, the, in 1970, he took a position as head of the Criminal Justice Project of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights in Boston. His career in public service continued through the 1970s, during which time he served as Deputy Chief Counsel of the Massachusetts Public Defenders, as Chief of the Public Protection Bureau of the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office, a position he described to me as a public interest law firm within government. Uh, and then, uh, after a stint in the AG's office in Massachusetts, uh, he served as general counsel of the Massachusetts State Ethics Commission. In 1983, Mr. Harshbarger was elected as district attorney of Middlesex County in Massachusetts, serving in that position until 1991 when he was elected as Massachusetts Attorney General. As Attorney General for eight years, uh, Scott won national recognition for his work in civil rights and hate crimes enforcement, prosecution of white collar crime, and insurance fraud and enforcement of child labor laws. 
He also led the passage of Brownfields legislation, which helped spur economic development in formerly depressed neighborhoods. As president of the National Association of Attorneys General, he was one of the first attorneys generals in the nation to sue tobacco manufacturers to recover smoking-related health care costs. In 1999, um, after um, running for governor of Massachusetts, and unsuccessfully, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but, uh, Mr. Archard was elected president of Common Cause, the nonpartisan citizens lobby. In that role, he guided the organization's efforts to support uh, federal campaign finance reform legislation, commonly known as the McCain Feingold uh, legislation. He expanded Common Cause's <coughs> agenda to improve election reform and launched its corporate governance initiative. He stepped down as president of Common Cause in 2002 and returned to the private practice of law at the Boston firm of Murphy, Hess, Toomey, and Lahane, where he was focusing on corporate governance issues. Mr. Harshbarger has received numerous, has served on numerous nonprofit boards, including the Board of Trustees of Union Theological Seminary, the Steering Committee for the American Public Health Association, and the Board of the Epilepsy Foundation. Over the years, he has taught legal ethics at Boston University Law School and served as a visiting professor at both Harvard and Northeastern Law Schools. The recipient of many honors, um, just last week he was awarded the first annual CJR Justice Award, which was presented at the 125th anniversary celebration of the Boston organization Community Resources for Justice. This provides a summary of some of Scott Harshbarger's many accomplishments. But as you all know, who have been here before, the real introduction, the one that deepens our understanding of our Coffin Lecture, will be given, as it always is, by another exemplar of a life devoted to law and public service, the individual for whom this lecture is named, Judge Frank M. Coffin. For many of us in this room, Judge Coffin needs no introduction at all. But for the sake of our law students, and others who may be new to this lecture, I will provide a very brief one. Judge Coffin is one of the small select group of public service servants who has served with distinction in all three branches of our government. In Judge Coffin's case, as a congressman, U.S. congressman, in the executive branch, as the deputy administrator for the Agency for International Development, and in the judiciary. First appointed to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit in 1965, he served as its chief judge from 1972 to 1983. He assumed senior status with the court um, in 1989, but as we all know, who know him well, um, that's hardly being in senior status. In addition to having hit hearing cases by assignment, he is also hard at work at his, at his memoirs and continues to give generously of his time and his prestige to ensure access to justice for all citizens. Judge Coffin has completed yet another important project this year on behalf of the public interest, guiding as co-chair of the ABA's Commission on Loan Repayment and Forgiveness, a study of, on the impact of rising law school debt on the ability of law graduates to enter careers in public service. The Commission's report and its recommendations are already having an impact in terms of renewed attention to this very important issue. A graduate of Bates College and Harvard Law School, Judge Coffin is the author of four books and numerous articles. He holds honorary degrees from Bates, Colby, Bowdoin, and the U University of Maine. Uh, and in, 19, in 2001, how old I am, I think it's still 1900s, um, <laughs> most prestigious award a federal judge can receive, the Edward J. Devitt Award for Distinguished Service to Justice. Although he is a graduate of Harvard, he has been a wonderful friend of Maine Law, supporting and guiding us and our students in many ways for many years. As I say every year, and I say it because it is true, <coughs> One of the greatest pleasures of my teamship has been the opportunity to work with Judge Coffin and to see this gentle, brilliant, and witty man in action up close. It is a testament not only to our lecturer, but also to the awe and affection in which the legal community, 
his clerks, and Nainwah hold him um, that all of you are here this evening on a night when our almost equally beloved Red Sox <laughs> are trying to battle their way into the World Series. No uh, It is my honor and my great privilege to present to you our very own MVP, the Honorable Frank. <laughs> Change. 
Public service can find a place in all of them. Indeed, it makes me think that Scott Harshberger has from the beginning considered his real career in public service and has merely been dressing it up in different clothes. What intrigues me is what lies behind this fascinating facade. From largely public sources, including a Boston Globe profile, I've been able to gain a few insights. We begin with our speaker swimming in a swimming pool, uh, in a community pool with several cousins, but swimming only very briefly. This was 1953, a year before Brown versus the Board of Education, and the attendant had shied away a black youth staying with the hash parties. Scott's father, chaplain at Penn State, World War II conscious objector and fervent seeker of social justice, wasted no time in ordering the kids out of the pool, and if this is racism, that is wrong. Next piece of evidence is a vignette from our speaker, as remembered by his Harvard classmates, and I quote, half fast Scotty Harshbarger, carrying football, knees turning, arms pumping, carrying would-be tackers with him as he charged for the goal line. That line of carrying would-be tackers with him reveals the real trick. So we have two clues, a combination of a father-induced social conscience and a focused determination to charge ahead and carry tackers with him. I must add these days that the sport is not football, but a gentler sport, softball, but not run of the mills softball, rather a focused, determined, and uh, hard, uh, hard play, fast pitch, fast pitch softball. He is a fan, however, of hardball, as we know earlier tonight, and I'm sure he wants to get back to the Huskings and watch what happened to that uh, hockey or football game or whatever it was. <laughs> As a young man, after finishing work under a fellowship at Union Theological Seminary and before going to law school, he worked in East Harlem among poor blacks and Puerto Ricans on housing projects, youth sports, and gang intervention initiatives. He said at this time, it was the defining year of my life. So much for the clues of the past, and what was the result? You are now aware of the extraordinary range of his efforts, from youthful counsel to an ethics commission, to reading the nation's watchdog of common cause. I have only a footnote on the nature of his tenure as Attorney General. Things that go beyond routine accomplishment and honors. He brought to law enforcement not only a persistent focus on effective punishment, but an emphasis on prevention of crime. The first is illustrated by his 83% conviction rate and 180 prosecutions of public corruption. His prevention record is one of innovation. Notably, his remarkable Safe Neighborhood Initiative involving both social workers and law enforcement personnel, and Operation Clean Sweep aimed at clearing neighborhoods of drug dealers. Now, putting on his hat as a private lawyer, he's urging corporations to look upon the current unrest about corporate conduct as a window of opportunity to clean an office, set standards for executive compensation, audits, and independent directors, and adopt formal ethic codes. 
This has been and still is a uniquely valuable career. It is the career of a congenital gadfly, in the dictionary sense of a constructively provocative stimulus. To some, this translates into confounded nuisance. But so often, so often today's nuisance is tomorrow's profit. Former Attorney General Francis Bellotti paid him the highest compliment, calling him my social conscience. His own close associate during his service as Attorney General of Massachusetts, the Deputy Chief of the Government Bureau, Peter Sachs, who was here tonight, mentions this by saying that time after time, when difficult decisions with political consequences had to be made, Marsh Barker's instruction was, do the right thing based on the law and the facts. When I called Peter, who clerked for me and also for Judge Deville, and said, did, did, did you really mean that? And he says, oh, we did that thousands of times. I am deeply honored to welcome the 12th Quantum Lecturer, one who has proven that one can have a social conscience impelling a public service and survive in many roles. The Honorable Scott Kashkar.
want to do anything else, but more importantly, you are enhanced and ennobled as a human being by having had these opportunities. And we simply wish that more people had it. Judge Fowler also represents my view of the holistic public servant, of somebody who has demonstrated something every day that we are deeply grateful for the people who serve in public life, but we also challenge them and expect so much of them. And very few people meet that goal or can, but he certainly has and students. With that, I would like today, tonight, to speak to you about a few thoughts that I've had based on the things that I've done since 1999. And I look back at 1999, for those of you that have had to grieve at various times, uh, when you lose an election, uh, albeit hubris, self-interest, ego, you also face the fact you lost. And the votes aren't going to change. There's still two and a half percent sitting somewhere in some box in Boston that I'm sure represent my margin of victory. <laughs> and every time you said in California that we're just going to get three percent of the votes, it doesn't really matter. I said to myself, that's a problem. But that happened. And in one sense, one phase of my life at that point ended. I'm sure all of you have had some experiences like this. And you're faced with the challenge of what you do now. Because something like you love, that you had the opportunity to work with exceptional professionals who came together, whether it was in a public defender's office, a law reform community, an attorney general's office, an ethics commission, a district attorney's office, an attorney general's office, who came together as professionals to try to do the right thing, to make a difference in the quality of people's lives, to represent people without who had no one, and who helped make me a far better leader, and also gave me a great deal of credit and honored me by their presence. That is my vision of what a public servant is a public servant who happens to be a lawyer. And that was the vision that I had. And I still do. But in this time, I've had a chance to think as many of you have. What difference is it today between 1999 and today? What has occurred that makes me feel that this has been, in the words of Judge Cobb, his favorite phrase, I gather, a sea change in our culture, in our society? It's not that we have today tensions between civil rights and security. We've had those at various times in our life, in my life. It's not that we're concerned about why people don't participate in our democracy, why the office of citizen is not seen as one of the still great obligations we all have in the greatest democracy in the history of civilization, and why people don't participate. Well, it's not a greed and financial incentives and corruption hasn't influenced the private sector in business or the public sector, and that's not necessarily new. But the change feels quite different to me, and it's not just because I'm now a grandfather with four granddaughters. It's not that I had the joy of moving from life to partisan politics to the world of common cause in Washington, D.C., where Shelley Pingree, uh, very pleased, succeeded me there but go way beyond all this in achieving the, the, the leadership. Um, but other things have happened. Some are very tangible. But one of the things I think we want to think about that I'd like you to think about is where did the passion go in the public interest law community? Where did our passion go as citizens who believe that we truly could make a difference in our democracy? Now, maybe you still feel that, and this is just an academic discussion. But I'd like to challenge you that I can be sure that you still feel that with good cause, rather than have a memory of what was. Because so many of us had the luxury, and it was a tragedy that gave us that luxury, of growing up in the 60s. Yes, that was a long time ago. Yes, there were rotary phones. No, we didn't have computers. All those things. But we could walk and talk. <laughs> but that period for me was defined. From the death of a president, assassination of a president, 
Actually, some of my heroes, Martin Luther King, Robert Kennedy, a Vietnam War that in many respects challenged us to see whether our government was truthful or not. A civil rights movement that while achieving wonderful ends, uh, also exposed uh, the deep, dark strain of racism that we have not yet even begun to fathom or remedy in this country. But out of it came a movement that people here have continued in every sector. The public interest law movement. Remember back in 1970, Common Cause was founded. John Gardner, who I got to know in the last few years of Common Cause, John Gardner came was in Washington and said that the only group in Washington that wasn't organized was the people. And it was time for the people's voice, the public interest to be heard. It wasn't to eliminate money or special interest. It was simply to say that in public policy and democracy, the people's voice ought also to be heard. And hundreds of thousands of people sent $100 for common cause to be founded. They happened to take on the Vietnam War, happened to take on a public corruption and ethics and financial disclosure. It could have been, as he said, tax reform. It could have been Bob Munson's corporate reform at that time. It could have been any number of things, but that's what well. Ralph Nader, and the consumer movement, the environmental movement, the earth movement, the civil rights movement is just common, and many of you in history have pointed out, in your lifetimes on the bench, the world changed in the area not just of administrative law, but of civil rights law into a whole other just set of genera generation. And I happen to be lucky enough to become a lawyer in that time frame. And I was probably lucky enough because my father, a minister, as was pointed out, tried to convince me that coming out of Harvard College and having spent a year doing the theological seminary, that while the ministry had been for him as a child of oppression, the first in his family to go to college, along with my mother who was a teacher in a one-room schoolhouse, and by the way, as a political belief, no reform in education ever taught the one-room schoolhouse for any of you concerned about education. But he believed that in the next 25 years of my life, the law was going to become the divine of the earth. And in a way, he was absolutely right. It had come, come and did come to define us. Every social, moral, and economic issue, the law was involved. If we didn't like a problem, as legislators or citizens, we passed the law. We made it a crime. And we handed it over to the prosecutors in the court system. And then it failed to solve the problem. We looked at society and said, what's wrong with our society? What has happened to our young people? Where has our sense of community gone? That our whole life turned into a focus on litigation and the law. And to some extent, that is a failure. Because the law, the litigation, and the law, most important, was never meant to be the defining ethic of our time. It was to set the minimum ethic, to put the framework we were then supposed to infuse in that civic virtues, religious virtues, educational virtues, parental virtues, the positive norms of our society. But sadly, for whatever reason, many advocated, and many of those institutions advocated their responsibility. And so it wasn't a partnership anymore. It was one or the other. And many of you have written more about this, thought more about this than I have, and could speak to more of this, all of you, could add your own thoughts about that, whether you agree fully or not. But I raise it here because I think today we will look back on similar kinds of circumstances and the question will be, was this the end of the era of the public interest being a defining value of our community and society, or is it the renewal, in the words of John Gardner, the renewal of our values and our commitment to what public service public interest means, not as a second segmented part of our society, but as an integral part of what it means to be a democracy. And that's what the title of my theme tonight is, Strengthening Democracy. In a time where we're thinking about security, civil rights, we're thinking about what it means to be a democracy, when you are in some great external pressure, great threats, what does it mean to have a strong democracy? And I'd like to think with you just for a few minutes about that. And that, allow me, if you will, to do it in this context. I want you to 
Think about if I can the view that John Gardner had that he was not alone. What it means to be a citizen of democracy. Now I recognize that for many, many people, the concept of citizenship has failed, does not exist. Civic education in many schools is not mandatory. Many of us have simply have failed to understand this, whatever way or not. You speak to young people, it's not that they disagree, it's that there has been no defining models or heroes talking about this. The Harvard Vanishing Woman Project has demonstrated that less than 50% of young people have grown up in families where their parents even voted. So something that seemed routine, fundamental, is not fundamental. Any more than it was for those of us, Peter Sachs and others, in dealing with safe neighbor issues and finding young people, young urban young people, who were rebelling, or we thought were rebelling. But the problem was nobody ever told them there was another way to resolve the problem other than run or fight. Learning that lost art of mediation, conflict resolution, was to them a safety mechanism. Learning that there was another way, because the community they saw, in their family, in their streets, on television, was a community where violence was the way that problems were resolved, including their own nation, as opposed to peace or other kinds of resolution. Now, that is deviates a bit from simply the theme that we're talking here about the fundamental value of being a citizen. Jimmy Carter is purported to have said by in his biography that he left the office of presidency, albeit volunt involuntarily, to assume the most important office in a democracy, the office of citizen. William Jefferson Clinton said the same thing when he left his last term. And John Gardner has spoken to this eloquently to remind all of us that, above all, democracy is not a spectator sport. Democracy assumes a certain mutuality. You can't expect your leaders to be honest and accountable if you're not going to be honest and accountable. If you're not going to vote, if you're not going to participate, if you're not going to assume the office of citizen, then where are the checks and balances? This is a government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That is democracy. And this is democracy that in the year 2000, at the closest election of our lifetime, the closest election of our lifetime, two candidates for president, and we don't even know if the one who was elected won. We know they won by one vote, five to four, the Supreme Court of the United States, the closest election of our lifetime. And certain things are interesting about that election. One, it was so close, it took 36 days or more with lawyers, not playing the role of articulating their values, but arguing about chance, legal strategies, which counties we count, which not. Also, the pictures many, many state secretaries of state sitting over there saying, never for the grace of God to lie, because in the high tech capital world, we don't even have to count the votes of the people who even come to vote and guarantee that they can be there. So all those issues are there. We also saw the highest turnout we've seen in recent times young urban black Americans, many of whom couldn't even vote because they weren't on the regist registration sheets in many states, in spite of the effort from the NACP and many of the efforts to get that turnout. That was all there. And the second piece we saw, of course, was an election that was close, but where both parties and both candidates raced to the middle as fast as they could, dealing with issues that focus groups had proved and consultants felt were not harm or offend anybody. And therefore, we didn't debate Issues that every American cared deeply about. They didn't agree about, but they cared about. The failed drug war, racism in the justice system, the death penalty, universal health care, a variety of other kinds of concerns were never debated in that final election. And in addition, we spent more money, hard and soft, than any election of our lifetime on television, on negative advertising. And the result of that was, in the greatest democracy in the world in the year 2000, less than 50% of the people who were registered to vote even took the time to vote. Even took the time to vote. A hundred million people in this country sat on the sidelines while we elected our president. Now, you've all heard that story. The point of it to me was this. We had a constitutional crisis. That close, the Supreme Court decided 
where the president's brother was in the state, governor of the state, questions about the battle, and yet this democracy stood firm in a way that most other democracies might have made. And we accepted the word of the Supreme Court even if we didn't agree with it, because it's in the essence of democracy to do that. That is a strong thing. The weakness was where have all the people gone? Why didn't they feel that they could participate in their vote counts? The issues that you alone can say were important, not even the ones that were on the table. Would choice remain a viable option for women? That's a Supreme Court of the United States issue. But what did we talk about? Corporate integrity? Did we talk about what we do with Afghanistan? Iraq? We didn't talk about any of the issues that today affect us. We didn't discuss the Patriot Act. We didn't discuss security and civil rights. We didn't discuss the really affirmative action. We didn't talk about any of those issues. The second piece of that, and that's our citizen piece, the second piece of that comes with the follows of that. What does it mean in a democracy threatened from outside? What does civil rights and civil liberties mean in that kind of democracy? Here's where the lawyers you would think, come into play to try to figure out this balance. It's our Constitution we're interpreting. Now, Bill Moyers has said that he never feared for a minute that we would not, as a country, as a nation, withstand external threats. He always thought we'd rally. If only going back to the memory of the greatest generation. If only to remember that external threat would pull us together. What he feared, however, was what we talked about in the first example. He feared erosion from within, that we would, by apathy and cynicism, erode the strength of our democracy, that we would not rally from within to have strength to figure out how to cope with these kinds of challenges. Maybe it's money in politics that drove us out. Maybe it's simply the candidates were not candidates for particular divisions. Maybe people are tired of partisan politics. Maybe it's because both parties are addicted to money. Maybe it's because my party, the Democratic Party, is on fumes and doesn't know what it stands for anymore. Maybe it's because the Republican Party is not the party of Lincoln and John McCain. Whatever reason it is, we didn't energize the United Leaders of tomorrow to participate. But more importantly, when it came time to have a balance right up front between what are our concerns about our security and how we balance that with civil rights? We as a nation had forgotten how to debate. We had forgotten how to act. Dissent does not mean disloyalty. We had forgotten the habits of citizenship. We had forgotten that a democracy, I don't have the right to have my way, but I have the right and the responsibility to be heard. I have the obligation to express my views. And yet, we as a nation really didn't know then, after 9 11, and still don't know today really how to discuss one of the most important, the important things that is occurring in our democracy, which we are testing up front in the paper every day the balance between security and public protection and civil rights and civil liberties. It's a tension. I think Judge Cochran has written about it, most of you have written about it. It's always a tension. We ask our police officers in this country to do something, we ask no, no other police officers in the world are asked to do, which is protect us, make our homes, our neighborhoods, our streets safe, but preserve our civil rights and civil liberties at the same time. It doesn't always work well, it's not always in balance, but we always seem to have a set of checks and balances dealing with that. We also know. And I yield to no one in this respect in being tough on crime, if you will. We know that one of the great civil rights issues of our time is whether you're entitled to the same level of safety and security if you live in urban America as you live in suburban America. Do you have lesser rights to be safe or walk home because you're black, because you're Hispanic, because you're poor? Surely you're entitled to the same level of input and control without becoming the subject of martial law. We saw we could do that, but we did it the old-fashioned way. The best achieved form of public protection is prevention, trust, partnership for progress. They were done, they were achieved. Now we come to this great 
threatened to face today. We're about to have a presidential election in which people simply do not know how to discuss and disagree without being disagreeable. We don't know how to do what Bob Bell even asked us on his 80th birthday when they dedicated this library in Kansas. He said, I hope, above all, we somehow figure out how to have disagreements in this country without turning it into a holy war. This is Bob Bell. He said, I want to have a show as legislators. We know how to get things done and achieve things. Now that is a challenge to us, to us as lawyers, because this is a class. Lawyers are defined in the law. The ball game here. The Attorney General of the United States is a lawyer. The leaders of the Civil Liberty Union are lawyers. The challenge is, who's talking in the middle here? Where are the rest of us? Where is the organized bar? Where are citizens? Why don't people understand that this is very important to make this country? Again, you don't have the right to win, but I want to rally behind my president. I want to make sure that he or she is having a debating discussion. We've lost that habit. It's a habit of citizenship. But it's also one of the things that every lawyer in this room was trained to deal with from the day we walked into law school. It was how to balance in competing times. Not what it was in 1968 when we went to law school, but the principles that apply today as the law evolves. Do we really want to have a Guantanamo Bay in the United States of America? Do we really believe that that's making us safer? Do we really believe that dramatically expanding the Patriot Act is what will make us as a nation free of terrorism? You may. I don't. I think what will make us free is people believing firmly that the law will be applied equally, that it will be fair, that whether you are black, Arab American, white, you'll be treated fairly. And you won't kid yourself, or we can't kid ourselves. And if you're sitting in this country and you hear us talk about this will just apply, and I say this very carefully, to Arab Americans and not to you African Americans, we're kidding ourselves. Every minority group person in this country understands what it means when we talk about cracking down on people's civil rights. And the rest of us need to understand and defend it as we did and have before. That's a challenge. We've lost the habit. We send our checks to civil and some of us go, some of us do. And we tell them, go get it. But we often sit back and we don't participate. How many of us are supporting or opposing a candidate for president because of our beliefs or feeling about security and civil rights in this day and age? You may or you may not. But how many of us are asking those questions of every candidate, including the president of the United States? The party of Abraham Lincoln and John McCain at the same time. The third piece that I'd just like to touch upon, which is often a longer part of my remarks, but I will not belabor your tolerant or test your patience much longer. But I do want to talk about the third piece because I think this is where the rubber meets the road in these intersections. The first, the election of democracy is all about us as citizens. All of us are citizens. Some of us are lawyers. And that's the second part. Lawyers have a special status in democracy. Lawyers have a special status as we act for it and claim it as the interpreters of the Constitution. It is a constitutional democracy we are expounding here. And lawyers have a special status and role in doing that and helping people understand that. And we ask for special privileges because of it. We therefore have a very special obligation to interpret it. And it comes to play in something pretty mundane. You can just chalk off this good old greed and scandal in corporate America. We've been through our 25 years ago in public life with ethics and financial disclosure laws. We went through it with people working in our nonprofit communities from time to time with high salaries of people diverting money for charitable purposes. And that's not good. It's not to be applauded. We've gone through some of that. Today, we face what I think is a very serious problem in corporate America. And I say this to someone who believes that the economic markets 
our economic system is the key to the quality of life for everyone in this nation. Is the only way we are able to say with any degree of dignity that every person in this country can make it, can have access. It's our economic system that does that. But when you can't trust the numbers, when there's not one independent director in America, as my friend, a vice president, at one of the major financial institutions said to me, there's not one, was there not one independent director anywhere in America over the last two years who would stand up and say, this is wrong? This is just because it's illegal, doesn't make it right? And more importantly, where else have we lost seven and a half trillion dollars in the space of a two or three year period and seen no political reaction whatsoever? <laughs> no riots in the streets, no demand for change of any major kind mobilized here? And why is that? Some of it's because we don't understand the words. Some of it's too complicated. We didn't go to business school. We're not accountants. We're not auditors. But some of it's also pretty basic. We have a massive breakdown, a massive ethical breakdown in this country. The SROs, whatever you want to talk about, money reached the independence of lawyers, accountants, auditors, CFOs, CEOs, boards of directors. And the people that paid the price was the average American. Main Street paid the price. Huge. In 401ks gone, retirements, pensions, jobs lost, companies moved. This is a massive political problem. It is not a partisan problem. It's not a Republican or Democratic problem. It's a massive social problem. We're seeing radical changes, but it's not occurring because the legal profession has identified it as a major public interest area of importance to deal with. And it's not happening because the average citizen is identified as that. And I believe, and close with this, that the average citizen does not understand what they could possibly do. Ben Barber wrote an interesting op-ed in the New York Times about a year and a half ago, where he said, this is not a failure of capitalism. There's capitalism. Richard Breeden has said, it's the problem of a few capitalists, not capitalism. And it's a market that needs adult supervision. And there was no adult supervision. And when we had no adult supervision in the 80s with urban America, we passed mandatory sentences, we sent them to jail, we did all kinds of things. We were just beginning to with white collar America to apply that law. But the reality was, in this area, people simply had not figured out what to do. We are making changes, and they're important changes, and changes can be made. But what occurs to me in this is the following. This is an area where every single transaction at Worldcom, Enron, Global Crossing, Adelphia, Tyco, QS, any of another dozen to 25 of the leading industries in America were serious problems of restatement and fraud and crime. <coughs> In every one of, in all those cases, every there was a lawyer who saw and reviewed and participated at some level in all of that. The challenge then is, was it truly our responsibility to preserve confidentiality and secrets? To be sure that our clients could get zealous advocacy within the law that allowed us to participate or advise and counsel our clients in that enterprise? Was it that we simply didn't know what our clients were doing? Were we, like in the New York Stock Exchange Board, either we knew it and felt that it was perfectly okay, or at least didn't cross any boundary line we knew, or on the other side, which is probably worse, we didn't know what was occurring, and yet we took our fees we took the benefits of that, and the result was that the public lost huge. So we come to this point. For me, these three examples demonstrate two things. One is we've lost the ability as a citizenry to 
figure out how to express our views can be heard in key corridors of power. We may test with the shareholder democracy in corporate America. We may figure out how to do it in other ways. But it's going to be a new day and a new beginning. The second is, as lawyers, there is lots of work to go around in terms of defining what it means to be a lawyer. To be a lawyer in the best sense. Not whether you have the good fortune to be in a public interest role. It's easy to be a dedicated public lawyer if you're a DA, a public defender, a legal aid attorney. That's the role. The challenge comes when you are in the middle of dealing with conflicting obligations. When you are representing your client, but you also somehow have to figure out what the broader obligation is. And if you don't do it, your profession needs to do it. And that's our challenge. The time this way, in a constitutional democracy, we need to have an active, aggressive, professional bar and lawyers interpreting our broad obligations so that the citizens can actively and positively fulfill their role as the office of citizens. They're not separate. They're all part of the community. It's the interstices that we deal with, the public and private sector, and those conflicting obligations. Fraud is not risk. It is not an ethical dilemma if your clients are committing a crime or you're committing a crime. That's not an ethical dilemma. That's just the illusion. <laughs> the dilemma is when the principles conflict. And each of you has spent your careers trying to find that balance. And probably done it very well. What I fear is we as a society have forgotten how to strike those balances. And in a democracy, in an era where the law should speak to the values of a democracy, inclusion, fairness, integrity, honesty, accountability, the law it's got to respond the way it's possible. It's a great challenge, but we can't succeed. John Gardner once said that the greatest opportunity lies, frankly, golden opportunities exist when you face insurmountable obstacles. And the only challenge is to convince the people that they have a role to play. People trump money. People in democracy win. We've seen examples of doing it. But we never do it by being passive. We never do it by complaining. We don't do it by whining. We don't get to do it simply standing on the sideline and being pure and virtuous, but not being in the fray. The challenge to each of us, to me, to you, is not to look at what our legacy was, but to do as Judge Coffin is challenging. With the legacy you have, what will you do with it now? How do you stand on the shoulders? and create for the next generation of leaders and activists, role models and mentors, and prepare them to reclaim our democracy and the pride and value of being a lawyer in the public interest, in public service, whatever your vocation may be. Thank you very much. values 
that exist collectively. That is, and, and I believe I've been very lucky to be in a position where my job was to define it broadly. And I think that is a that role of definition is actually very important because it helps you. And I think in the early part of my life, maybe this is a function of aging, and I don't admit that I'm aging, but in case I was aging, <laughs> life gets a little more gray. The black and white doesn't apply. The things you say you never tolerate, guess what? Your kids do. I'm a recovering parent. <laughs> so I, you learn what you never say ever uh, about anything. But I think that the role helps me define that. I think one of the challenges is the first is I think the public interest law movement is no longer a movement. I think it's a cease to articulate a broad based stand, set of standards. I think we have divided into some factions. Some of us are about function sophistication. But it's actually why I think the, new, the corporate governance piece offers a real opportunity. Because I think we have not yet defined what the public interest is there. Bob Monks may know, Rick may know, people, people may have some idea, but I don't think publicly we have yet really articulated what we expect the obligations to be of boards and directors, what we expect of shareholders, what we expect of government in relation to them. So this is an opportunity in a way that I think 30 years ago was the way with thinking about the environmental or consumer law movement. There's an opportunity here to articulate what's the broader public good that you are trying to achieve. And that doesn't have to be a litigation, that can be legislation, counseling, advice, uh, advocacy. The group is missing here, I think, in the other ones. And each of the other ones took my part. This is why I felt so good about the tobacco litigation as attorney general. Not really out, I'm not happy to be out. The end result was not everything I wish at this point. But I was happy because it was, fun, once again in my lifetime, a chance for the law to support a public policy already being established. The early civil rights litigation and the environmental litigation was in support of a popular public movement. The people were moving. They were trying to articulate what it meant to care about the environment. And the law was used as a supplement to help define it. Sadly, with any movement, the danger of litigation in the courts are it drains the energy out of What do you do in a court case? You can't pick at the court. You really can't, except in the worst cases. Jim Crow. You can't pick a court. So, in some respects, my definition is how you are, is, is a public interest is, in, in the law is, our, is helping move forward a public policy that also has it as yet no defined special interest or and or people who really don't yet have a voice. Now, that doesn't always mean you're going to be right at the end of the day. But I think that that's one way to do it. The second is the challenge of public interest, I think, is and we can talk about, some of them talk about this more. I think it's very tricky for a lawyer who has private clients to play that you can't even play out these cases with a profession. I mean, a profession can't be saying we support equal protection, equal access, legal services, and everything else, and that's why they die. Just because we can't provide. I mean, so just take that piece. You can't now get a job with public interest. You know, we have to provide an opportunity for every person who wants to be a public interest lawyer. You can't go get a job right now if you want to do that instead of going to a law firm. So the profession has uh, things to do with it in that regard, I think. They're, so I don't know if it's an answer, but at least I'll stop. <laughs> <laughs> can I yes. I can be, actually possibly a little bit more brief if you'd like this. <laughs> <laughs> this is to make a comment here. Yes. If the Supreme Court were writing its first political campaign funding decision today instead of in the 1970s. Do you think they'd come out differently? Boy, I hope so, but um, I think this is one of the games. There are lots of you sitting here as judges in this room who know how this thing sort of, you know, unintended consequences are a real problem. Uh, if I were doing it, well, my answer to the Supreme Court in, in funding is, I think, the, I think there's I think this massive loophole in soft money is, is in my view, and this is my view, uh, the judgment was changing his mind this, it's a no-brainer. I mean, you have a set of laws that people found the scene to get around so they can pump 
huge amounts of money in the individual campaigns and committees. That has been illegal. It should have been declared illegal. If we had any kind of enforcement, the Federal Election Commission would have been illegal a long time ago. But that didn't happen. So now the Supreme Court said there. The second issue is what's the First Amendment mean here? And I think it's got, you know, I don't think the First Amendment necessarily, you know, it, it deals with disclosure of, of money. But the trouble is we have so many interpretations of it. So my answer to this is let the Supreme Court decide what it wants to decide. Hopefully it will, you know, sort of be very, very artful here and try to find a narrowest possible interpretation, whatever it does, and send it with it. I'd like to see it go back to Congress. But the second is, I think this is why the alternative theory to the public interest is public money. I truly believe that the main solution is the answer in this area of campaign finance in my lifetime. Because there's so many unintended consequences that occurred here in terms of how this all played out. But one thing that's crystal clear today is, it seems to me, is if you want to spend money and you want to spend your time raising money, you should be able to. But if you don't, and you want to, you're willing to go under restrictions that are appropriate under public funding laws, then that makes sure that they'll have contested elections and let people run for office on their merits. They're not going to always win, probably won't win all the time. But at least it offers that alternative. Because the thing they're trying to change the campaign finance laws, in my view, is that you're not, you've given up on bribery and corruption in one level. I mean, it's legal now to give tons of money to somebody who can make yourself in and there's no shame, there's no outrage, for lots of reasons. But the other side of it is, it is not in a democracy tolerable for, in my state, 80% of Democrats or incumbents to run uncontested every year, year in and year out. In a democracy, you're supposed to have elections. You're supposed to have contests. And when money is the barrier to contests, then we have to find a way around that. You can't go through the law. And maybe this goes also to your question. Our problems has become, we're always trying to find a legal solution to something, when one of the answers to this is, and I say this carefully, the way Howard Dean is doing it today, and as the way the way like Arnold Schwarzenegger did it in California, you mobilize the people. The people were angry as hell in California, and they're not going to pay it anymore, and he was the mayor. And we may not agree with it, some people do. The 75% of people in California who we haven't had turnouts like that in elections anywhere. And those of us who claim more participate cannot complain that the people took the time to go and vote. We've got to now do a better job of Bill Warriors here. We've got to start saying to people, in the words of Bill Warriors' cab driver, he always uses, he says, Mr. Warriors, people think that we're, on the, we're stupid. It's not, we're not stupid, we're just uninformed. And so part of the job is to do the education piece. Howard Dean has demonstrated, whether you agree with that, that if you have a message, you mobilize people, people will mobilize and they'll give money. That may be the most important thing that's going on on the Democratic side right now. So I'm going to keep seeing a solution outside of the law. I want citizenship, democracy, to answer some of these questions, not the Supreme Court of the United States. Yes, sir. This is much of what you talked about, uh, sort of uh, two theories that are working at cross purposes, which are uh, compromise and leadership in government versus an obsession with absolute victory. Uh, because it seems to me uh, your comments uh, from Senator Gold uh, about uh, disagreeing with it while well, being disagreeable, uh, it seems to me that at least in recent history, uh, those who have been participating aren't, aren't really interested in rewarding that type of approach. Uh, and we have a tendency to reward those, uh, those candidates, those uh, public servants, who are tend to be uh, um, stick their heels in and demand only their their way, and they get less credit for saying, "Well, my side can get a little, your side can get a little. Let's you know, let's do it for the good of whatever." And that's cited as sort of recent history, both uh, the first President Bush in, in saying, "Well, I, I said I wasn't going to raise taxes, but now I will uh, because we need to," and a, a recent uh, presidential candidate um, who may have run into the middle. Um, but figure that maybe he might be rewarded in that area. Um, wonder about the comments. Well, I mean, first of all, you, you probably should try to use speak to address that point because a lot of my, that's a great example of what I think the issue is. I think, I believe that in a democracy, you're going to have polarized views. I mean, you're going to have ideological Republicans, ideological Democrats, ideological libertarians. 
Uh, you're going to appear passionately for ideological duty. That's perfectly tolerable. The end of people who get formed that way because of their special interest is important to them. And, you know, whether it's a pharmaceutical, a tobacco company, whether it's the labor unions, they're going to have their interests. They're going to drive them. The way we conduct our politics today does, in fact, advantage people who are, in that sense, kind of polarized. Because the rest of us stay on the side of it. We don't like it. We don't like conflict. We don't think it matters. My own view is that one of the things that's going on in our election cycle right now is that both parties have find it's better to have less lower turnouts than higher turnouts. It's one of the reasons for the opposition to same-day registration, to easier ways to do it, because you can poll it, focus group it, know who's coming out and target it. And a lot of the, the credit center established and 98 percent of the money raised in, in most campaigns goes to negative advertising. So it's meant to drive down turnout. It's meant to convince you that you're right. Your face against things right. It doesn't matter if I vote. Apathy, cynicism is right. It's not insane because it's fair to say, as Russ Feinfeld was saying, any group here, when he was running for U.S. senator, he truly believed that any for state senator, he truly believed anybody could grow up and run for president of the United States. That. He said, today, when we did the Americans of, uh, uh, for Freedom uh, Reform Movement uh, tour of the country, he would say, today, I do not believe that. Unless you're wealthy, unless you're very ideological, or unless you want to spend all your time raising money, you cannot be elected to any federal office. Now, my answer to that, in part, is that that's why we have got to find out how we get people more involved. I tend to think it's going to happen in two ways. One is grassroots level. I challenge anybody in this room who wants to run for city council, selectmen, school board education, you could do it as long as you get 20 people in this room who will hold signs for you, go vote for you, you win. You can win at the local level. And that may be one of the ways to start. Secondly, I would like to be interested, I don't want to have to take the time here, I don't know how many people in this room have run for office themselves, supported candidates at all levels to run for office, given money to a candidate, or even I hate to ask you, how many people even vote some of the last time? So that we sit here with not even doing the standard things in terms of participation, and it's not an accident, therefore, that those people who care, those that have special interests, those that have ideological interests, win these elections. The vast middle of America, the trouble with the vast middle, it sounds a little bit uh, uh, paternalistic, but I think it's true. When you can get more people voting for American Idol <laughs> in 24 hours than you can get to care about who's your president, who's your senator, you know, it's not the consumer, the problem that certainly can't blame the consumers. I mean, there's something going on here that has to do with the lack of relevance that the political process uh, has come to represent uh, for most people. It's why my hope in large measure is actually the corporate governance movement. Because I think that the opportunity here is to mobilize a broad coalition of business people, Republicans and Democrats, and 90% of CEOs who want to play by the rules, who are fully prepared to compete fairly, who, who actually really got nailed because WorldCom and Tyco were playing, were, you know, were, were playing off, the, off, off the books. The vast majority of people and economic interests at stake. Every single citizen in this country has a stake in having good economic recovery and businesses that do well by doing good. And I think the challenge is how you talk about it, the challenge is how to make it relevant to them. But that's the opportunity. It's not partisan, it's not ideological. It is, though, affects somebody very basically. Uh, and this is, I think, getting, figuring out how you get people to care and get committed is the first step in democracy. And I believe that we're back to that. I think we have lost a habit. Not just a habit, we've lost reason for why we should care. About who gets elected. And when that happens, we erode the very core of substance of a democracy. And that's our greatest weakness. And for that, I thank you and I apologize.
system that work and um, <laughs> Um, next year, I always like to use this opportunity to, to tell you um, who our Gotham lecturer is next year. Um, next year, our 13th Gotham lecturer um, will be here on uh, Thursday, October 14th. I'm sure you're all opening up your calendars and writing that down. Um, it is Justice Richard Goldstone, who is um, Justice of the Constitutional Court of South Africa. Um, Justice Goldstone served as Chair of South Africa's Commission on Inquiry Regarding Public Violence and Intimidation from 1991 to 1994. Many of us know uh, the work of that commission. Um, more recently, he served as Chair of the International Independent Inquiry into Kosovo, and he's been involved in many other important human rights activities around the world. So it would be a wonderful opportunity for all of us, and I hope if you have your 2004 calendar, you'll mark down October 14th. Again, thanks for coming, and let's hope that while we were doing this, the Red Sox won. <laughs> was um, we were optimistic, we believed we could make change happen, um, that things were susceptible to change and law could make a difference. And we all have a feeling, or we have a feeling, that maybe that's changed a little for you. So I wanted him to inspire you to those values which were so important, I think, to all of us in our generation. So, Scott. Well, let me first allow people to Go drink and get your pizza, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm honored to be here with Judge Cawthorn because I do, I do think that if you look at a full a career in full, somebody who's been in all branches of government, uh, he sort of exemplifies not only the experience range, but also that you can, uh, what I think of, absolutely match your professional skills with your personal values and have an impact. Uh, and the same way for me on that is that Throughout this career, whatever I have sacrificed financially, which my wife and you know my adult children who are not going to have a major inheritance and all that may regret, uh, in return, uh, it's been the kind of career and the challenge for me now is to continue that, in which I've had opportunities to do what very few people get to do. One is to go to work every day and feel you can make a difference in people's lives, whether you do it or not. Secondly, to be in situations where you're using the law as a major tool of social, economic, moral, or justice, reform or change, by using the rules of the profession, by using the standards of the profession to do that, uh, and affect change and reform. And thirdly, you also get to attract people who share those sets of values, uh, who want for some period in their career to, in the public sector, make that kind of a difference. Now, the footnote to that is, and I have to give this quote to Jim Tierney, the former AG of Maine. Uh, you have to understand my bias about this. The bias is this, as Jim says, the least interesting thing a public lawyer does every day is more interesting than the most interesting thing that an associate in a private firm does any day. Uh, now, that doesn't put food on the table, that doesn't do a lot of other things, but what it does do is, is demonstrate that if you do this well, and I've had the fortune of being with the people who've done it well, you can attract incredibly good people because you can challenge them not only in terms of mission and vision, but in terms of professional experience. Because the great benefit of the public sector is that you tend to get, sometimes inappropriately, more experience faster, more responsibility, opportunities to make mistakes, learn, grow, 
ideally in circumstances where you're well supervised and evaluated so you get that trade-off. But my recruiting tool was always that if you can handle it financially, I will promise in return that you will get the best professional experience practicing with us in the public interest that you would get anywhere. And that that's the balance. Now the balance works best when your spouse or significant other is employed in the private sector. <laughs> and it works best if you keep talking to all your friends who are in law firm. Because every story you tell will be far more interesting than any story they can tell. And so you'll get sort of some sort of reward uh, from that. The two other pieces I want to say just about this, and not to be facetious, are that whatever you do in your career, my, my advice is that every two years, you look at what you're doing, wherever you are, and decide if that is professionally and personally what you want to be doing. Now, you can step back from that this way. The next five years of your career ought to be you ought to see as a postgraduate period. Unless you know exactly what you want to do, and many of you may, I think you're, you've got to look at the next period as being your PG years. You're trying to figure out not what you want to do, but what you don't want to do. You want to eliminate options. Now, this is the great advantage of co-op programs. It's a great advantage of clinical programs. It's a great advantage of using your summers. Uh, but you can also do it during like You're trying to figure out what it is you don't want to do. Uh, and you have time. The other flip of that is if you do want to go to a private firm, and I did, uh, in a much different time, much different circumstances, didn't face the golden handcuffs that many people face now. But it's particularly important if you go in either for the private firm or public, that you, every two years, in the public sector, you need to do it because you're going to start to feel that either you're a second class citizen, you ought to be doing something else. So you want to know why you're doing it. So for the next, but you don't commit yourself for life, just say, for the next two years. And my theory was if I get you for two years, I'll get you for eight. If I can't convince you after two years that this is more valuable for you to do than something else, then until the finances overdo, overwhelm you somehow, that will be the thing. And then, and that was my biggest benefit was having people stay over long periods of time with me. In some cases, uh, particularly, I benefited from the period in the 1970s uh, where women were simply not able to get in to major Boston law firms, uh, and I. I just was blessed uh, to get just outstanding people who ended up, by the time I finished as district attorney, 65% of my supervisors and chiefs were women. And more than half of my prosecutorial staff were women. And I only stress that because they were also incredibly qualified attorneys. But it also helped me deal with my first experience with why it matters to have a diversified workforce. Because it meant that we didn't, I didn't have to worry about whether we were concerned about children, victims, domestic violence, a whole range of issues, because we had people in the office who had that interest anyway and were in leadership positions. Uh, later, it happened to help me with some of our civil rights work in affirmative action. Effort. That's how I've strayed. But the two year point, it does seem to be your biggest challenge here, it particularly be interested in public interest. And what I would argue to you is my, my goal is totally to get you to spend some part of your career uh, in the public sector, is to do it in two-year chunks. So if you've done it, you're not committing yourself for life. If you're in a private firm, you're, you're trying to figure out, you stand back periodically and say, okay, is this, am I getting enough out of this? Am I using this? Am I, for example, as a friend in my private practice, getting some pro bono time? Am I spending some of my, this is not all one or the other. You could do a lot in a private firm uh, in terms of the community, in terms of politics, uh, in terms of, uh, of working, you know, trying to help uh, with this good general counsel, with clients and others. I mean, there's lots of things you can do. It's not one or the other. The benefit, I close with this, is the benefit is, I found, is I think pro professionally and personally, in terms of values and insight, if you've had experience in different sectors, you're better at doing that job you're in. I mean, the best prosecutors I had had been public defenders or have been in private law firms. There are many very good ones who did nothing but prosecute, but the benefit hugely of having other perspectives was a major advantage. And I believe on the other side, uh, the best, you know, the best corporate attorneys right now 
are people who have been prosecutors, former prosecutors. And it's not only that they aren't ideologically, uh, they're not ideologically rigid, is they also understand practically how the other side thinks. And strategically and tactically, that's a very important uh, goal here as you, uh, as you go through. And finally, the biggest thing we need in our profession are advocates for the public interest. And there just are not enough systemic. Right now, I mean, I think it is an embarrassment that the legal profession is not you know, a rabid advocate for greater expansion of legal services programs, public defender programs, AmeriCorps, all the institutions that would allow any student who wanted to participate in public interest practice to do that. Because it's a profession we are committed to, even if individually we're not, we're committed professionally by our preamble to ensuring equal justice, equal access. We're ensuring that people, you know, that people get legal services and, and defender services. And we absolutely do not provide that. Uh, and I think that it doesn't mean you're going to be perfect in doing this. But you've got the profession ought to be major advocates. And the best advocates I've ever found come out of law for private firms. And invariably, the leaders have been spent some part of their life in the public sector and know that it wasn't just being charitable, wasn't just a pro bono, it was the best professional years of their life in many cases, and they want to replicate that for other people. Okay, open the floor. If you don't ask me, I'll start, I'll keep going. Just, I'll just warn you, Judge Coffin starts. Well, let me, I'm, I'm going to open up because I think that, that, that there's a compliment here with our two guests. Um, um, what you just said, Scott, Judge Coffin has just um, spent two years being co-chair of the Commission on Loan Repayment and Forgiveness that was set up by the ABA to deal with the question of law student debt. And I look around the room. Law student debt um, and, and the impact that that's having on the ability of uh, law students. How many people in this room? I mean, is this, is, am I doing something? How many people in this room have more than thirty thousand dollars of debt, or will graduate with more than thirty? How many people in this room have more than forty thousand dollars of debt? Fifty. Will have. Will have. When you graduate, not just men. When you graduate, and in Maine, um, the, the typical public interest salary is about thirty-one thousand. Judge Cox. That, that's why. <coughs> Um, as Scott said, I, I, I think it's a wonderful starting point to get to work either for a state or a federal prosecutor or defender or a public interest firm like Pine Tree. Um, but you have to be independently wealthy if you're going to pay your 50000 to, in many cases, now well over 100,000. Uh, our studies show that this on the average uh, debt repayment requirement is about a thousand dollars a month. And if a nine tree legal that salary of 33 or whatever 35,000 uh, has to pay 12,000 of that. Fulfill his loan obligation. Uh, you just kind of pack it. This is the problem we, we're going to have to live with. This is a terrible time for action to be taken. Our commission uh, has a number of steps we would take to liberalize federal legislation, various loan funds, and, uh, choices of. Uh, tax deductible uh, mechanisms that can be used. We're not likely to get any of them in the short run. And we also have a toolkit showing states how they can initiate uh, loan forgiveness programs so that loans can be forgiven during a period of tenure with a public interest job. Um, states uh, are may adopt the program, but no state really has funded such a program as yet. <clears throat> and this looks like a very bad time for states. 
So I view this as a as a serious obstacle, but nevertheless the goal is eminently worthwhile. I think that uh, if a private firm is necessary for you to keep up your loan obligations, <clears throat> don't lose hope. I think any service in a private firm gives plenty of opportunity for public service. In my own case, <clears throat> I started out in Lewiston, and one of my earliest jobs was uh, corporation counsel for the city. This was a part-time job for which I was paid the munificent sum of $2,000. But it was a way of getting into city government, knowing what, what ticks, knowing how people act and interact. And as Scott is saying, it uh, gave me some, some, not only some stories that were better than my private counterparts, all the private counterparts were able to give, but it gave me a, a, a good maturing experience. I came to Portland and joined Daryl Maynard, and this at the time was uh, a highly uh, respected small, well, it was, uh, I guess, one of the two largest firms in the state, as perhaps it still is. We had 12 people in the firm. <laughs> My partners were uh, all Republicans. I and my uh, debt to them was that they gave me some latitude to follow my bent and work in politics. And I was at that time in close association with uh, Ed Muskie. I was chairman of our party because the party was in such poor straits that <clears throat> they would take a neophyte like me and, and uh, uh, put me in the spot of state chairman. You know, I had a ball. And I owe a good part of it to my firm because I had the freedom there that I wouldn't have had had I been a sole practitioner. I'm not sure they liked the result when, uh, when the folks all came in and, and Muskie became governor. But uh, even then, it wasn't a, uh, a disadvantage for the firm to have been associated with at least one member of the office of charity. So, and I think today in firms there are many other ways of uh, advancing your interest in the public service, but whatever you do, I, I fully second Scott's strong feeling. And to me it's heartening that we have a man like him who is going into this new field. That I think, you know, Several years ago, if you had any theme, uh, uh, several years ago, when we were thinking of the Coffin Lecture, Law and Public Service, we would never have thought of getting someone from the corporate field. Uh, so that I think the time is right, and uh, you are perhaps once again the leader to lead us out of this wilderness. The problem is the precedent judges, every time I start a new career, the salary goes down. So <laughs> I'm not sure that it, I'll probably be the first, you know, pro bono corporate governance <laughs> expert. <laughs> uh, it's always, it, it, I wanted to echo one thing because I would like to have questions for people. But here's the, I do want to stress, and I want to get into my democracy speech with you, but I, but I, I don't see the two as at all, I see it totally interrelated. That was part of my speech last night. Was it is impossible to have a good, either legal community, full-blown legal community, or a full-blown democracy without having sort of them interconnected? They are. They're sort of a foundational piece. And let me give you an example. It, the broad civic aspect is in this democracy, our values and policies all get articulated through a political process. We can not participate and let others do it, uh, or influence it that way, or participate. Because, but that's the nature of a democracy. And so that I've always said to every group that cared about their constituents, professionals. I mean, if you don't speak for your clients, who's going to speak for your clients? I mean, your social workers, uh, whether you care about the environment, the consumers. If you don't get involved, who do you think's got to be involved? The special interests are involved, 
they, they, they do it better than any, any other form group because they know why it matters to be involved in politics. They know why it matters to contribute to campaigns. They know it. They, and they expect something in return, but, but that's entirely appropriate in democracy. In the absence of the people on the other side who speak for the public interest, who sort of, for whatever reason, dropped out. Now, that's a little bit of speak. Let me get a second specific, though. Any one of you in this room, I think, I mean, I could run for office. You may not want to run for office. But my experience was exactly Judge Cobb, same as Judge Cobb. I gradually met my first experience in politics was working for a city council candidate in Cambridge. As a result of that, I made contacts I never have made any other way uh, as a part of that campaign with other professionals, with other people. I think people in my campaigns, I would look around where they are now. I mean, I look around and see people who, because they were working, and, now, and you may want to think about it, people running, particularly for professional offices, DA, attorneys that don't, they don't run for any in Massachusetts, I mean, in Maine. Uh, but, a vehicle here is running for these because you then come in contact with attorneys, you come in contact with other professionals, uh, and you get a lot of responsibility, a lot of opportunity to do that. And that can best be done often out of a private sector law firm. Most law firms will allow you to spend some of your time in that kind of, uh, of action and, and work it out. It's a way to, to keep your ties in to places where the action, and, and at the same time, you will actually, I think, begin to realize that you can make a difference in in that sphere. Uh, and I think that's our greatest challenge with public interest is that even in even in the politics has been that people don't think there's an opportunity to get started. It's why, without comment, the Howard Dean campaign impresses me at this point because it's giving people who didn't feel they could have an impact seem to feel they're having some impact. But I think a lot of this is habits, getting used to the habit of and the other thing with the judges talking about his era, I mean, I was benefited from being in a law firm when the judges' contemporaries were partners. And it was assumed that you would participate in some kind of it was It was assumed that you would be involved uh, publicly in a number of different things uh, because they saw that as a value uh, to, the, to the firm. One of the challenges today is a little bit my generation, which is. If you're lucky to have some firms who've seen this, it does work, but there's too many of us that didn't, that never did the, the, the mix of public-private uh, practice. So, but it, it, there's no magic formula here, but uh, in, in almost every case, you, you can do it. That's why, the, and I just say financially, I just want to emphasize, the next five years, if you look at this as an issue of paying off your loans, it will limit you. I mean, if you get one, great, but it will limit you. I mean, your goal is, if you're not careful here, you will limit your options, and it will be just what we're talking about in corporate America. It will be trying to get a short-term return and sacrificing a long-term investment. And this is very practical. This is not about nobility. This is not about having your life enhanced and feeling good about yourself. It's where do you want to be in five years or ten years, rather, what do you want to do for the next two years, and look at this investment you're making, your law firm loan alone, as a longer-term investment in your career. Uh, but that's, I mean, I know that sounds a little bit easier said than done, uh, but it does help you give a time frame for what you're trying to look at here in terms of the finances. Uh, and I don't know, you know, it's an awful hard turn on $150,000 starting salary, I understand that. We don't have any of Since I never had that. You know, <laughs> he started in 2000, I started 8500 for Crown. We'll start war stories here, so if people have comments, please. For Judge Connolly, mm -hmm. how for me? It's not a, I know these people. They're afraid of doing this. So if you are interested in getting started in public interest, um, not just in me, but other places, how do you go about it? That is, for me, the hardest question. Because, I mean, I, I, sorry, I, I think this is, this is the most frustrating thing I've encountered in the last five years. It was frustrating when I was AG or DA, but at least I could say apply to the DA's office in Middlesex County. You know, when I was there, I'd say at least try us. You know, we 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 believe in recruiting entry level people and all that kind of thing, and, and for lots of reasons, and, or new people that did. But this is very frustrating to me, uh, and, and it's why I think that part of this is a systemic political issue. Uh, for whatever reason, we have decided that we're not providing easy access to these kinds of jobs. Uh, so I do two things. One is I say to people, well, that's why you shouldn't be applying. You should 
I'll put this is on tape, so I'll be careful right here. I think you are entitled to apply to a law firm, and as long as it's not a single practitioner who has chosen you and therefore excluded 25 other people. If you keep looking for a public interest job, a clerkship or something of that type, it is a situational ethic that you are entitled to do that. That is, I think you can have it, try to have it both ways. That is, in one sense, since the vehicles that offer you opportunities right now are private law firms, whether it's the interview or other process, you can play that role while at the same time looking, keeping an eye out for the public interest jobs that sometimes don't come in until near the end of your third year, don't come in until the next year. Now, the argument for law firms I would make is, I've never seen a major law firm deny somebody a job because they got a federal court clerkship. If they got to clerk for Judge Coffin, they hold that position for them for a year or two years if they got to do it. Uh, and I think that's some of the same argument I, I would make here. The second is there is there are some good sites. If you can't, can't access it otherwise, I'm sure people here do a great job. But the Harvard Law School Public Interest uh, Office has a website that is available for anybody in terms of looking for public interest jobs. And they sort of pride themselves on the fact that they make it available to everybody uh, to look at. And I always urge people, and law schools even, to tap into it. Why not? They have the money. I mean, you know. And, they, they, and all it is is a network that gets you opportunities to, uh, uh, to check that out. Uh, the third one's the toughest one is volunteer. Uh, but you know, if, if all else fails, I mean, there, there is a part of me which is that a lot of jobs come up in public sector, nonprofit, or other places for people they know. And it's not patronage or anything else. It's you get to be known or, and I'd say for the next year and a half, by the way, I think I would look strongly for some of your political campaigns as a way to find some vehicle uh, to, to, to get to know uh, some connections, uh, particularly New Hampshire right next door, uh, with some other things going on in these campaigns right now. It's not a bad time to be looking around to that kind of a volunteer. The volunteering uh, is, is, is a way to, to get into places, to get to know people. Uh, and the other place to do it is you tap these outstanding companies. Because you've got some great law professors here who have networked all over the country. Question. Also, uh, for lack of anything more definite, if you're in a private law firm, and a firm of any size, uh, there should be, I think Scott would say, you're entitled to, and under the ABA policy and principle, every lawyer should spend a, a significant percentage of his or her time in pro bono work. Now, the pro bono work, uh, is is uh, this is a wide range of things. We found that in, that one of the greatest needs in Maine was people who knew family law, uh, and most of the firms, big firms in Portland, uh, were not very good at that. Very few people knew anything about it. Uh, what they finally did, they the leading firms here chipped in and they paid for two persons who worked with Pine Tree on family law. That is, that's only a drop in the bucket. If you, as a private firm lawyer, uh, want to find out where you can do a lot of good, it is to go into fields like that and make yourself an expert in, in that field or other one, immigration is another field. That, and there are, of course, uh, public interest groups. Uh, there's an immigration group in Maine. You would be a, I'm sure that if you knew anything about the, the field, you would be an A1 candidate for a board of director position in that organization. And while that doesn't pay, it certainly is a, is a significant contribution. Uh, the same would be true of equal justice, which is a uh, your alumnus, alumna, Rebecca Smith, is a uh, staunch member of this small but very significant uh, legal services. And uh, a senior attorney at uh, one of the big firms, Roger Putnam, is, uh, is uh, uh, on the uh, 
part man in the board of directors, and he is getting his kicks out of doing that as well as making another contribution. So both service itself on a pro bono basis and the service as a, an advisor and outside director of these are satisfactions. While you're waiting for a perfect job to open up, what I wanted to ask to, to follow on that, I mean, is the issue here, and I want to be clear what the issue is, is the issue that it's a lack of public <laughs> jobs or that it's also a little tricky finding the private law firm jobs? I and mean, I suppose it's both, maybe it's both uh, here. I mean, so they're not necessarily sitting in a position where they know they're going to go to a firm, and the only question is then how do you sort of keep your, 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 your ties open? Uh, and which is the judge's comments, and so anybody that has that, I mean, that, that's absolutely crucial. And, and first, first of all, I would make the argument, just forget all the benefits of pro bono work. The more contacts you make, the more clients you're going to get, the more marketing you're going to do, I mean, for your firm and yourself. I mean, it is also helping you very selfishly identify a whole lot of other possible avenues uh, that are worth uh, connecting with. Uh, but Therefore, if it's not a question of the private firm, then I would I, I would make a serious pitch for for the volunteer because that's how you get the expertise. I mean, you 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 should you should make every effort you can. If you want to be lawyers, you got to practice law in some vehicle, some device. Now, I happen to think that good public service jobs, are good. legislative jobs, are good public service jobs. Uh, every legislator is looking for a good policy help, some help, volunteer other bases. You get day, you get on the train, you take your saddle down to Washington, D.C., and you start walking around the hill and talk to, you know, you get Olympia Snow and Susan Collins and, and these folks, and get them on the phone and say, you want to meet people down in Washington, and you want to get out and visit, and you're coming down. And I'd like to see, we'd like to see some people. You go get uh, David to get his son, who's the Partnership for Public Service, which is Max Steer. It's a heavily funded group that people are surprisingly don't know much about. They're trying, the partnership got a ton of money to try to find people who would apply for federal jobs because over the next five years, 50% of the federal workforce is turning over. Uh, so the Partnership for Public Service is an access point uh, for public service jobs in the federal level. Uh, and so that you, you want to you want to look at where the potential uh, you know jobs are here. And I also I think you may be, you know, I also think that the in-house, we haven't talked this, we talked about it in the last class, but I never have done as much as I should have of, of reminding people about other companies. He started as a municipal corporation council job. Every municipality, every city has some kind of corporate law department. I mean, and my course at Harvard was all about gearing people to say, to say look at state <coughs> government jobs, state prosecutors, district attorney's office, municipal council. The range of things municipal council today handles rivals any general counsel job in the private sector and any state attorney general's office most of the time. Every kind of law, tort, and that's the second. So the relevance of that then is to look at places like that that give you expertise as well as giving you uh, interest in doing something in the public uh, sector. That's, you, you, I don't believe this is about getting those other jobs. That's how most people I know got into private law firms, actually. Other questions or comments? Yes. Is there any, I know we're talking about you know, starting private and then you call the sexual equipment. Are there any, for those of us who have a shorter career ahead of us, is there any order that's better than the other? I'm just started. <laughs> private sector. Uh, you know, you, you can't look, you know, you know, if you look around the room here, you do feel old, they're all just old, but... They don't matter. Is, is your question whether you, in terms of the sphere, what, what do you want to try to do in the next 10 years? What do you want to do? What, what would you like to do in the ideal world? What would you like, where would you like to be in 10 years? I want your job. <laughs> <laughs> which, which one am I going to do? Yeah, what is your job? A paying job, a paying, hard for a job. Hard -hard job. Okay. But I mean, if, if, if you're particularly interested in corporate governance, that's right. accountability issues that are really coming. Okay, if I were here, if I were looking the next 10 years here, I would go, uh, where I'm going to go at 
down the corporate library, in the corporate library board, in the, the, which is the, it's right now in front of the thing, months and no minimum start. It's becoming the corporate governance uh, research and accountability place. So it's right here in Florida. Corporate library, I'm going down there at 2.30. Uh, second, so secondly, Bob Monks and Rick Bennett are doing some similar thing here. I know some discussions are occurring about possible joint program and corporate governance between the law and the business school. Uh, right here in uh, in May, uh, so and that's the uh, you happen to have it right here in terms of one place to look. The second is I would look. I would think I would I would not write off this general counsel world right now uh, at all. I think and actually I mean I, I was I going to say that I think I've always I haven't touted it quite as much. But I looked at the number of lawyers I know in Mass. I mean one you know, I forget the numbers. A huge number that are actually in house counsel. Uh, in uh, either major corporations or small corporations, uh, and you know that's that's sort of an evolving area that's evolved. And there's a whole association uh, of, of, uh, of folks. There's also a whole growing world of corporate compliance people now. The Ethics Office Association has a website. I mean, there's an increasing area here of people, uh, and there's a corporate. For those of you who know, there's, a, there's an American Corporate Council Association uh, that exists with a website. I mean, everybody has a website, what am I saying? I grew up in Rotary phone days, it's just okay. Uh, so the avenues, I think that, that those are the avenues that I begin to look at, would be to see where you could where you could go to get certain experience like that. Now, if we're right here, I'm not sure what that experience is exactly. I mean, but I think you're trying to get some way, how does it, how do you do compliance work? How do you think about ethics within a corporate culture? How do you get to right, advise, be a, uh, advise a board? Uh, now that then goes to Judge Coffin's suggestion. You know, one of the things that many people have never done is worked on boards. As surprising as that is, the, the principles are the same here that's applied. I mean, if, if you want to talk about where the next examination is going to be again, is going to be a nonprofit board. So, I mean, people who have been sitting there and doing nothing, they're on it because they're fundraisers, they're on it because it's honorific, not because they're really working at, working at this. I mean, it gives you experience, but then becomes relevant. Uh, Interestingly, most banks in Massachusetts encourage the big bank to still exist, uh, encourage their employees, they have a program to encourage their employees to serve on boards of nonprofit uh, uh, corporations or serve on boards. So that, that the corporate sector is not one to, to walk away from here quite as lightly as we as I think we've tended to because for whatever reason it seemed to have to come from sort of a different background. If I'm right at all. I mean, I think the next few years, the real, the real opportunity to have an impact may well occur within that sort of uh, 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 culture. And uh, but again, you're going to be more appealing if you have some experience and expertise and thought about uh, that kind of thing. But that's what I would, would uh, we begin to look at is that setting for those kind of uh, those kind of jobs. But it's kind of a hybrid. Now, well, I mean, look, the kidder says it's only, I'm, I'm saying it's a hybrid now because I want to believe that there's a chance I'm having an impact as well as selling out. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, if we're talking about this, if Dean asked me to tell you how this was a seamless web, you know, my career just meshes nicely with this. The, the only, the, the part I would say is that, I'd say, no, I'm very lucky. I think myself is very lucky. I mean, I, I have. And what? She, she's worried about this being a webless scene. Yes. <laughs> the, the thing here is that I've been lucky to be in situations that are challenging professionally. And that they that sort of push you uh, uh, to do that. But where you're based on, you're, you're using your legal background is really the framework. I mean, for, for me, as opposed to the judge, I think, I mean, the judge has done all these public things, but also I think doing law is the law. Okay? I think there's no doubt about that. I have to be a big stretch for me to say that I love the law. That the fact, I, mean, I love being a lawyer because of the opportunities it's given me to in systems and to make change and to use it as a vehicle for equal justice and equal protection, broadly speaking, uh, and to have that kind of an impact. I mean, I think there's, I would argue that's the benefit of going to law school. Keeps your options open. You really have, and you cannot discuss any issue in our society today without understanding the law, uh, no matter what role you're in. And those of you that are here because you were victimless advocates and social workers and got tired of lawyers getting the job and the promotions are here because you're trying to get joint, you know, get added to that experience. So I think that the law gives you that 
it's the problem with it, but it also is the great opportunity because there are a range of opportunities you get by this background you're getting now. And I think the way to think about the law school is, is that if you're preparing yourself for a platform of how to solve problems, how to mediate disputes, uh, how to give good and solid advice and judgment, uh, you're, you're really not preparing to be the best tax lawyer. You know, you'll get to be the best tax lawyer when five years from now you find you love the tax law and you haven't been in the right place and you get a chance to do lots of those cases, but in the meantime, you're trying to keep your options open. What was your favorite job of all the ones you had? My favorite job? Besides the one you have now. No, no, it was, uh, <coughs> the, being attorney general was, it, it, the reasons for it were that it was sort of a, it was a classic progression. I mean, all the other jobs had prepared me for, in Massachusetts, the attorney general's office, which was, by definition, outstanding and become, it was seen as the best politics were to be, the best profession you could be. It was a 500 person office. Uh, we represent all the state agencies, so we had that defensive function to be able to be strategic advice and counsel. We had independent power to do environmental, consumer, civil rights. So the AG's office in Massachusetts sort of one of those ideally situated offices with the power. So all the experience that I had, Colleen, up to that sort of prepared you to lead that. The second piece was you did it in a network. This is the geographical choice that I, was, I think was lucky fortuitously. I stayed in one place and had all these different jobs within the same legal network so that you had the ties and the next, now that was, that enabled you to, to be honest, they would tend to get to attract the best students. I mean, we, we, we had, and the reputation helped you get your friends to refer the best people they knew. You knew. The people who, political people, wanted to refer me people, but they would only refer the best people they could because they worried about the other, you know, because of the, the law that we had, the reputation was established. Uh, and then you got to use the law in a very affirmative way. And I think that I was, I also though think as much as I did that, that eight years was, I mean, given in Massachusetts, we, that we had no tenure, no civil service issues, so I could really literally, I had no excuse not to change, to make the office, shape the office in my image, if you will. And, and I had done a big action plan for what I wanted to do. And, and thought we should touch everybody's life every way. And, <laughs> and it was it. And, and I was only that. And I also realized when I got to Common Cause, as much as I loved that job, uh, I had been really spoiled as a leader. Uh, I had exceptional people working for me who really made me look really good. And who, 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 who and we had, and the public sector with the only limitation we saw wasn't excellence. It was the expectation of excellence that you had to be the best you could be and you had to be in the right place and you get a chance to do lots of those cases, but in the meantime, you're trying to keep your options open. What was your favorite job of all the ones you had? My favorite job? Besides the one you have now. No, no, it was, uh, <coughs> the, being attorney general was, it, it, the reasons for it were that it was sort of a, it was a classic progression. I mean, all the other jobs had prepared me for, in Massachusetts, the Attorney General's office, which was, by definition, outstanding and become, it was seen as the best politics were to be, the best profession you could be. It was a 500 person office. Uh, we represent all the state agencies, so we had that defensive function to be able to be strategic advice and counsel. We had independent power to do environmental, consumer, civil rights. So the AG's office in Massachusetts sort of one of those ideally situated offices with the power. So all the experience that I had, Colleen, up to that sort of prepared you to lead that. The second piece was you did it in a network. This is the geographical choice that I, I think was lucky fortuitously. I stayed in one place and had all these different jobs within the same legal network so that you had the ties and the next, now that was, that enabled you to, to be honest, they would tend to get to attract the best students. I mean, we, we, we had, and the reputation helped you get your friends to refer the best people they knew. You knew. The people who, political people, wanted to refer me people, but they would only refer the best people they could because they worried about the other, you know, because the, the, the law that we had, the, the reputation was established. Uh, and then you got to use the law in a very affirmative way. And I think that I was, I also don't think as much as I did that, that eight years was, 
mean, given the Massachusetts, we could have had no tenure, no civil service issues. So I could really literally, I had no excuse not to change, to make the office, shape the office in my image, if you will. And, and I had done a big action plan for what I wanted to do and, and thought we should touch everybody's life every way. And, <laughs> and it was, and, and I was only that. And I also realized when I got to Common Cause, as much as I loved that job, uh, I had been really spoiled as a leader. I had exceptional people working for me who really made me look really good, and who, 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 who and we had, and the public sector were the only limitation we saw wasn't excellence. It was the expectation of excellence that you had to be the best you could be. That it wasn't enough just to care about the environment. You had to care about the environment. You had to be the best environmental lawyer. I mean, that was the key to the job, and that tended to create a dynamic, a dynamic with. Uh, so. I thought I did the best job as a leader, but I also realized I did it because I had people who reflected back my values. Now, that's the best, the best challenge, and I'll never have a better job. And, that, and that's also been reflected by Bill Clinton said that as Attorney General from Arkansas. Joe Lieberman has said that in Connecticut. And the reason is, it's because it's a political elected job, but it is the one job you get that the best politics is to do the right thing. Now, think about that. I mean, in a way, that's what you got to do as Attorney General. As an elected official, I was independent, I had discretion, and the politics were to do the best job you could. Was that you, you got, it's one of those jobs that do the right thing. It's also the problem in running for governor to be an Attorney General because the people you have indicted specifically remember. And they don't care that you were fair, responsible, professional. Uh, you made their life hard. That the, the next phase, I think, would have been a great challenge, and so that's so the next. I'm lucky to have a second, second, third phase in my life. But that was that was a great, a great job. But it was also the sort of culmination of all this stuff uh, and all the talents of people in this room. That was great. Uh, now the Tom Ward's coming, and we're going to recreate the famous tackle. So. <laughs> <laughs> I announced that you had tackled. God, yeah. Earlier point of your respective lives. I was the bit player on a lousy team. <laughs> <laughs> a star on a great team. For one 15 minute moment, <laughs> the suns were reversed. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was turned around. That's all I get like 15 minutes in the sun. I, 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 I think that if that's Tom and Scott, if, uh, you know, if this were a good day, which it is, whether they would replay this. Replay. Yeah. 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 And you can raise money for the capital campaign by selling chances or something. It would take us 15 minutes to recreate it. But right <laughs> 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 Any other questions? No? For someone whose interests double dipper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, for someone whose interests aren't necessarily aligned, but people need as a traditional public interest job, what would you suggest? Well, give me that one again. <laughs> oh, well, you know, there are some interests that naturally lead themselves to public interest jobs, but there are some interests that seem sort of contrary, like partnership taxation. So what would you suggest? Uh, <laughs> partnership? Uh, taxation. Woman after my own heart. <laughs> so, what would you suggest for somebody that has um, an interest in something like tax but still wants to do some public interest? Well, I think that's very that's a very good question. I think that uh, let me just reflect it back to the AG answer the AG question. The thing I find to be the greatest problem in, uh, in my experience in the public life and nonprofit world is the acceptance of less than the best. That is. Many times it's because of resources. We just don't have the resources. But I find it intolerable uh, that we accept less than the best professional standards we can. And far too many groups do that. Uh, therefore, you know, you know, we therefore excellence in the I always thought that having the best is more important than the public sector in the nonprofit world because you are the vehicle for people who without you have no one getting something done. And it's almost more of a burden on you. You've got to be more efficient. You've got to be more effective. You've got to try. It's not tolerable to be anything else. So you try to track the best and, and do that. Now that, that's why the tax specialty, uh, I think one of the most important projects that we started in Boston over the last year or two, which I'm not I'm afraid of, is an economic justice project, which is trying to get corporate law firms to provide advice and assistance 
to minority and small businesses who they don't need just a small business associate. They don't need $250,000 more. They know how to handle basic tax and other guidance. What is fascinating for me is most the best judge, this wonderful person who edited did, was to translate. The lawyers knew the law. They couldn't talk to people. They had no way of talking. This wasn't even, they don't know how to talk to most clients, but they did not know how to talk to a Hispanic entrepreneur trying to run a hairdressing place and figure out how to do it. They didn't know how to talk to them. They were scared stiff. They felt, though, really good once they did learn how to talk. And that's what the, so my answer to you is those